We've got a heated floor we're pouring today, pouring on radiant heat. It's pretty typical for a radiant heat floor here in Maine. We got two inches of styrofoam wire mesh, radiant heat tubes tied to the wire mesh about every eight inches apart. So we pour a lot of these up here in Maine. Four inches thick inside a frost wall, and then they run everything over to where they'll hook it up into the system right over here. They stub everything up. We got hot and, hot and cold water here. This is probably going to be a bathroom or a kitchen, but this is your basic heated floor. All right, so first truck's here. We got 15 and a half yards, so he splits them up evenly. Mixing up right now. We use these. We use these rear dump trucks. They don't have too many front axles here where we are, so most of all the pours we do, we got to use the rear dump on. And then we always we got a chute extension there. We use that one a lot. That's an eight footer. That comes in pretty handy on a lot of these pours. As you can see, the access the access isn't really that great for getting around this thing, at least not with a concrete truck. So he's just finishing mixing now. We got mid range in there, so we're looking for about a six and a half, seven slump. Make the pour nice and easy. Now, if you're thinking of doing radiant heat for your heating system in your house, this is basically what it's going to look like in the concrete floor itself. Now, there's three types of radiant heat there's hydronic which is what this one is. And then there's electric, where you can put electric mats of radiant in your concrete slab. And then there's hot air, which basically goes under your floor system and just heats your wood floor system, which isn't very efficient. The electric one really isn't that efficient. This one's the most efficient one. And this type of radiant heat is actually great for people with allergies too, because it's not blowing air around in the house so that you're, you're house isn't dusty or anything like that this one you know it definitely heats the concrete slab and then the concrete slab makes you feel warm when you're when you're walking on it when you're sitting on in your furniture or whatever like that so it's definitely the better type of heat as far as radiant heat floors go this one has two inches of styrofoam under it so the styrofoam does a couple things it it insulates the ground right it keeps the heat from going down into the dirt into the sub base and it deflects the heat upwards so it actually helps the heat get upwards into the into the slab and then obviously heat whatever you know room you're in in the house this one doesn't have a thermal break around the perimeter now we don't do the prep here we don't do the radiant heat we're just hired to pour and finish the concrete floor but we do i don't know we do hundreds of these in a year so in Maine, I mean, a lot of people heat with radiant heat floors. So that we're pouring on it every single week. We're pouring on floors with radiant heat. And a lot of them will actually have a thermal break around the outside edge too. I got a concrete uh, website that talks all about this, uh, the, the advantages, the disadvantages, the costs. I'll have a link for that down in the description. You can, you can click on that link, go to my website and check that out if you're interested in radiant floors. It has a lot of good information there. But I just wanted to give you guys a little perspective on how we pour these. Are they any different than pouring a regular concrete floor? Um, not really. I mean, they're both with or without floors are four inches for us. We pour about the same slump. We pour the same mix. If anything, we're, maybe we're just a little more careful not to puncture the tubing. Although the tubing is really, really uh, rugged. It's it's really hard to puncture actually so i think i've only in 40 years of doing this i've only ever punctured one and that wasn't while we were pouring that was while we were sawing the contraction joints after we got done troweling there was one little spot in the floor that kind of kind of heaved up a little bit i guess it didn't really heave up but there was there was one little spot in the subgrade that kind of lifted so when we saw the contraction joint we just nicked the tubing with the saw and we had to cut out a tiny little spot about one by one so they could fix that and then replace it. But pouring concrete like this, I don't think I've ever, not that I remember, ever punctured the pipe or damaged the pipe pouring. So you can wheelbarrow on it. It's pretty rugged stuff. This one here is a pretty typical application that we see is the, the heating guy usually wants the tubing right on the bottom. They don't want us lifting the tubing up into the concrete. Uh, for whatever reason it seems to heat better this way is what they tell us so so and this one's on wire mesh 
we see them both ways tied to the wire mesh like this is. Now the wire mesh is basically in there for this for this pour just to keep the tubing nice and straight and neat and secure so it doesn't doesn't lift up into the concrete slab. It's not really for reinforcement. We got fiber mesh in the concrete for reinforcement in this so we don't really need the wire. The other way we've seen it done is without the wire and then they just staple the tubing to the styrofoam and that works okay. I mean it is easier to to kick one of those stapled areas and have the staple pop out and then you gotta just make sure you push it back in. This is definitely a lot better. The, the tubing doesn't move when you wire it right to the wire mesh like this. This is the best way I think. Um, but both ways work. But as far as pouring the concrete floor, I mean it's pretty basic, pretty simple for us doing it. So if you're thinking of doing your concrete floor with radiant heat, there's, there isn't really anything else you got to do other than probably just put the styrofoam down. You don't really need styrofoam in a regular concrete floor if you're going to heat another way. I guess if your floor was thicker, maybe 5 inches or 6 inches, it would actually hold the heat in the floor longer if you needed, if you needed to do that for some reason. But probably 90% of the ones we do in houses are 4 inches thick. Sometimes they'll be five, but mostly of most of them are four. Darren's shooting grades right now. Um, whoever did the prep on this did a pretty good job. The subgrade was within about was within about a quarter of an inch as far as being level, and that that's really good in my opinion. So that makes it really easy to lay the styrofoam on, and then obviously lay the tubing on top of that. We're getting this first truck dumped out. We can dump right out of the chute on this one. We don't need a pump truck. Having that little eight foot chute comes in pretty handy. So that saves, uh, you know, for us to get a pump truck for something like this, it'd be about a thousand bucks just to get the pump truck. So having a eight foot chute that costs about a hundred bucks that we can use over and over and over again, definitely saves the homeowner a lot of money on floors like this. Plus we can tip that chute like that too to get up over the wall, it makes it easier pouring. So he's got about half three quarters of a yard left on. We're going to just empty him out, get him out of the way. And then the second truck can pull up while he goes and washes out. Who? How many of you guys pour on radiant floors like, like I do? Let me know. And if you do anything different than we do, let me know that down in the comments. And then who of you are thinking of doing a radiant floor? I mean, is that why you're watching the video? Because you're thinking you uh, want to heat your floors and you're just wondering how the process is done? That web page I showed you earlier has got a couple other videos of us pouring on radiant, pouring radiant floors also. So it has a lot of good information about that. One of them I think is on pouring right on top of plywood too on the first floor, subfloor. So you can pour actually radiant concrete floors right on top of plywood if you need to. We got a little extra help today, Eric there in the white. He's actually a school teacher. But he works for me for a few weeks in the summer. He's been working for me for over 25 years doing this. But he uh, he teaches school during school season. Now there's a bunch of pipes you can see over back there. One Obviously some of that is probably like a utility room. And the orange tubing is for the, the radiant for the furnace. Whatever's going to hook to the radiant tubing. The blue and the red pipes are for hot and cold water for whatever throughout the house you know I don't know if they're going to be having some other type of um, bathroom down here or kitchen in the in, down here or, and then obviously they'll probably have another one on the on the next floor up but this walkout this is what we call a walkout foundation where you can actually walk right out of the foundation at floor level we there's a lot of foundations like this because of the way the landscape is here in Maine. You can see how the landscape slopes. That allows for a walkout foundation like this. That concrete foundation goes down below the ground 48 inches, so four feet down below. And that helps protect it against the frost line here. Now Luke and Eric are screening while T is uh, doing the raking over there. And I'm in over there in the corner screening a little area that's got a floor drain with a smaller screed trying to get out from beyond all those pipes over there. 
we finish these the same too. As far as the power troweling goes, I mean, we'll just, we'll power trowel this exactly the same way. This guy's actually going to stain his concrete floor, so we'll power trowel it nice and smooth. And then he's going to stain it with some type of color. And then put a, like a clear finished epoxy with a urethane over it. And just have the concrete floor as the finished floor. They look really good. You know, when you power trowel them nice and smooth, it's a pretty cool look. Getting around all this, all those pipes and stuff really slows things down a little bit as far as the pouring goes, but I mean, it's not too, too bad. This is early in the morning. This is like 6.45 a.m. in the morning. We're getting going here. Now that second truck is backing in, and he's mixing right now while we're doing all this, so he's getting all ready to go. And then I'll back him up. I don't want him to back all the way up to the foundation without me backing him. Because I don't want him to get too close to that. We don't want to crack the foundation. So he gets all his shoots ready. Gets, gets mixing. And he's just there waiting for us. You got to shoot. I'm over there with a grade stick with a laser. You got to shoot a few extra pads around all these pipes to make sure you can get the floor nice and level. So I'm I'm magging some wet pads there right at floor level, giving the guys something to screed by. That's what Eric's doing right now. He's striking the pad with a, like a seven foot screed. We use magnesium screeds when we go around all kinds of pipes and stuff like this. That one right in front of you is probably about a 14 foot one. We got all kinds of different levels, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, you know, 7, 6, 5, all different types of lengths that make it easier pouring. We could really, honestly, we could really use some new screeds, so any, if any of you manufacturers are out there listening and you want to donate some screeds to have on camera, you know, just, just um, contact me and those screeds we got are pretty old, so it's, they're almost, we're almost ready for some new ones. Eric was in there with like the six footer. I got the seven footer and I'm just screeding out that area. Darren's fixing up around those pipes, getting that nice and level. The more level and the cleaner you can get things while you screed and pour like this, the easier it makes the finishing process. The less the less touching up you gotta do with uh, the power trial and getting on it by hand afterwards. It makes finishing so much easier. Now I teach porn and finishing inside the Concrete Underground. That's my private membership group area. That's down in the description too. There's a link for that if you want to check that out. If you want to learn how to do all the types of things that we do, that's the place to be. Just join that membership and then you get access to me and all my training videos that are in there. So we're just waiting for Eric to get that last part both loaded, screeded, and then we're going to get that that next truck back in, get that shoe hooked on, and stop pouring the second piece. Whenever I dump out, whenever I got two trucks and I dump that first one out, I'm always looking to see if I've gone halfway. <laughs> you know, if it hasn't gone halfway, then you start getting a little nervous about running out. But this one, this one, we were just over halfway, so it's looking pretty good as far as not running out of concrete on this one. There's nothing worse than running short, having to wait for a balance load that could take, you know, who, who knows how long to get there, an hour, two hours to get back, and then you gotta, you got to fight with a cold joint in the floor. So we always try to come out beforehand and check the grades with a laser, get our chalk line snapped. That way we know exactly how much concrete to order. You can see I'm backing him in there. I want to make sure he doesn't get too close. I've never backed one into a foundation. I've never backed one close enough to crack a foundation. So I don't want I don't want that to happen. Yeah, that, you can see how handy that shoot is. You can get those shoots on Amazon. I, I think I have a link for them too down in the description. You can check them out. Your, if you have a local concrete store like we do, we got a couple of them like an HD Supply or a White Cap, you can get them there too. 
They definitely save a bunch of pulling. We don't wheelbarrow. I don't know. I don't think we wheelbarrow any floors. You know, we, we always use those chutes. If we can't use a chute, then we have access to a conveyor truck that'll reach 40 feet. You know, you got to pay extra for that. Not as much as a pump, though. And then if that won't work, then we get go for a pump. I got a 12 foot chute on the truck. I got a 16 foot chute on the truck too. We can actually hook those together with the right slump and enough mid range or actually high range water reducer. You could pour, you know, you could pour down 40 feet of chute without damaging the concrete. So that's it for the chute. We'll get that out of the way. A lot of times we'll get it out of the way and the concrete driver will just wash it and rinse it right up for us. That way the concrete doesn't start drying onto it. Good thing about having the fiber mesh in the concrete is, you, you know, we don't have to worry about the wire, pulling any wire up or anything like that. And when you've got a floor inside a foundation like this, it's not going to go anywhere. The only, way, the only place it could really go would be is if, if something settled. But usually the general contractors that we work for, they they do a pretty good job making sure the excavating contractor compacts the dirt and lifts as he fills in a foundation like this. So he'll put in, depending on how big his compactor is, you know, he'll put in six, eight, ten inches, and then compact that, and then fill it up some more, then compact that. So it's more than likely they're not going to settle. Now again, I'm shooting my pad, my wet pad in the, in the middle. We generally will shoot pads. Sometimes we'll put in a grade stake with like a nail through it right at grade. But for the most part, we'll just shoot them with a laser like this and then we can then we can put them wherever we need them. We don't have them like pre put in the slab. I'm magging where we came off that that last truck right there, just getting that ready to go for the for where we screed this. Darren and I are going to strike that pad, then we're going to turn it and come down that front edge of that the front wall. We just find it, with all these pipes sticking out through, we find it just a little easier just to hand screed around most of those. You could use your power screed if you've got one. If you don't hand screed like we do, I mean, you can use your power screed. Just got to be a little more careful not to create any dips or humps with that as you go around all those pipes sticking out. When we screed like this by hand, because we've been doing it so long, the floor comes out really, really level, we find. Eric and Tia just spreading out the concrete, getting that section leveled. We're gonna we're gonna dump out a little bit more concrete, and then we're gonna come up right up here and screed this piece right in front of you here to the right. Get off all those pipes. So what we'll do today is we'll leave probably leave two guys here to, to finish the power trial. One guy pretty much the power trial. One guy to go around all the pipes and do all the edges. And then three of us will head to a different job. We'll either pour another job or we'll go prep and set up another job for the next, you know, the next day or two. So that's typically what we like to do is we pour every day, leave a guy or two, pour another one if we, if we got one ready. Or if we can get concrete for another one. It's Sometimes it's pretty difficult to get concrete. But... Uh, or we'll at least go prep something like a pool deck, a patio, a stamp concrete slab, a couple more floors. Um, but we're always doing prep and staying because we've got to have concrete ordered at least a couple weeks in advance. So we have concrete ordered every day for a couple weeks in advance and at least two trucks. So we try to get something, at least something ready and then 
if we know that something else is going to get ready to pour, then we'll call the batch man and say, hey, can we get can we get one or two trucks on the second round for this day? And he lets us know if we can or not. Our batch man, most of the time, he, he reserves the whole first round, which for him is nine trucks. He's only got nine trucks. So he'll reserve that whole first round for guys doing floors. And then the second round, he usually reserves for guys doing footings and walls. So that makes it pretty good for the floor guys, at least. So sometimes it's kind of difficult to get a, a, another floor in on the second round because, you know, all the wall guys have them. But this is basically, I mean, this is basically how we pour a radiant heat concrete floor. So if you're thinking of doing heated floors and you're wondering what the process is to get them poured by a crew like us, it's basically the same as a regular floor. It shouldn't, it shouldn't really cost you more for a crew like us to come in and pour a floor for radiant heat. So if you were wondering that, you sh a company shouldn't really charge you more to pour and finish a concrete floor. Um, most concrete guys like us, they, we don't do the prep, we don't do the tubing, we just come in and pour. So you're going to have to either do the tubing yourself or hire a heating guy to do the tubing. But this is the basic process guys, so again, check this out. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, please go down there and hit subscribe now. I come out with two videos a week all about doing concrete stuff. Thanks for watching, we'll see you on the next one guys.